They tell you that hell is hot. A raging inferno filled with the screams of the damned and tormented. They were wrong. Hell is cold. A freezing black void of silence where the condemned spend an eternity far from the light of God. Only their wretched memories to keep them company. Even they begin to fade over time. How long had I been in this aching void? I, I had no idea. I still remembered my name, my family, and my friends. The faces of my victims, though I tried hard not to think about that. In life I had suffered from a deranged madness that had caused me to kill. It was only when I arrived in hell that my head cleared and sanity returned. I suppose madness was a kind of escape, not allowed for me here. More time passed, a day, perhaps a year, a hundred, a thousand, when a light suddenly appeared in the darkness and an angel stood before me, an angel with black wings. A golden band, almost crown-like, circled its head. I realized I was looking at a halo. I couldn't really make out the sex. The creature looked beautifully female, terrifyingly masculine all at the same time. The only thing I did know was that I was in the presence of evil. An evil that made my shriveled soul shudder. Christian Davis, the thing said, looking at ancient parchment. Get to your feet. I was just about to answer that I had no feet when I realized I was suddenly clothed in flesh again. Hurry up, slave, the creature growled. You have an audience with the king of hell. All of a sudden, an eternity alone seemed like a blessing. Lucifer, I croaked, no longer used to speech. The fallen one did not answer, but turned his back to me and slammed his midnight wings together, illuminating what I now saw was a small cell with slime-covered walls. Follow, he commanded, leading the way. I did as I was bid, stepping out of my cell and entering a vast hallway where rearing black pillars reached up into a starless sky and strange creatures swooped and called to each other shrilly. It seemed like we walked for an eternity through an ever-changing landscape of horrors. In one place, fire burned and the smell of sulfur hung heavily in the air. In another place, the ground was covered in an orgy of naked bodies. The air stank of sex and blood, and I realized to my horror that these lustful bodies were not individuals, but one writhing mass fused together forever by their own terrible desire. What is this place? I finally worked up the courage to ask the fallen one who stopped and surveyed the scene, reaching out a hand to stroke a nearby thrusting buttocks. It's hell, of course, he laughed. In my father's house, there are many rooms. Come, he said, moving off. It's not wise to keep Lucifer waiting. He is not known for his patience, and his wrath is a terrible thing to behold. Some time later, we stood before a black castle. The terrain was black and arid with skeletal trees from which hung rotting corpses that screamed and cried out as ravens tore at their flesh. In there, the black winged angel said, pointing towards a huge archway that was emblazoned with a glowing rune. My master awaits you inside. You're not coming with me? I pleaded. Terrified at the thought of being alone in this place. Not me, he said, looking at the castle thoughtfully. I stay away from that one as much as possible. His mood has been dour as of late, and I would like to keep my head a little while longer. Now go. I would tell you to pray, but God hears no words uttered in this place. That said, he quickly turned away and left, leaving me alone. For a moment, I was tempted to run, but where to? Where did one hide from the king of hell? Taking a deep breath, I pushed at the massive wooden doors that swung open easily, as if expecting me. Inside was a great hall with a high vaulted ceiling. 
There were no windows, only black obsidian walls, and yet I could see quite clearly. And I realized the illumination was coming from the end of the hall. As I approached, it grew brighter and brighter, pulsating around my body with a terrible cold heat and like I could stand it no longer and I fell to my knees, crying out half-blinded, and yet I was drawn onward like a moth to some terrible flame. And then, just like that, it was gone, and a golden throne shone before me. Sat upon it was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen. A terrible beauty that you would die for, kill for, give up your very soul to possess. The creature smiled at me, as if reading my thoughts, then stood up, repentant in its golden armor, its black wings unfurling as it looked down at me with piercing blue eyes. Stand up, it said, but I could not. I, oh, I could only stare, taking in the, the, the splendor of the creature before me. With a sigh, it stepped back, bathing itself in a glowing white light until only an ordinary-looking man stood before me in an immaculate tailored suit and tie. Is that better? He asked. Yes. I answered, slowly climbing to my feet. <laughs> you mortals, he laughed. Such simple creatures, so easy to bedazzle, so easy to manipulate. Whatever was my father thinking when he created you? <laughs> I wonder if he regrets it. Come, he said leading me over to a nearby table that was laden with all manner of food and smoking joints. I realized I was hungry. Ravenous. With a cry, I leapt to the table and started stuffing food into my mouth, tearing at smoking flesh, cramming strange and exotic foods into my mouth until my stomach started to ache and groan. I tried to stop, but I realized I could not. My will was no longer my own. I, I was choking now, gagging on rich food. I staggered away, falling to my knees, and was violently sick, heaving smoking chunks of flesh onto the floor. Through all this, Lucifer sat at the table laughing uproariously. <laughs> tut tut, he mocked. Don't you know that gluttony is a sin? <laughs> what will you do next? I gasped, suddenly furious. Pull the wings from flies. His smile faltered then. And he caressed his own wings lovingly. No, I would never pull the wings from anything. My own were torn from me on the day I was cast down. It took me an eternity to grow them back. And when they did, they were black. The ultimate jest from an unforgiving god. God, I spat. What's he ever done for me? In life, I was an insane, crazed killer. And in death, in death, he left me here to rot. Indeed. He said, leaning closer. It was that seething hatred that drew me to you. Uh, it put you on my radar, he might say. What do you want from me? I said, staggering to my feet. A good question, he said, playing with a golden goblet from which he drank. Very good question, indeed. Uh, tell me, uh, Mr. Davis, how would you like to get out of here? Uh, a small vacation if you will. After the job is done, I'm sure that you could be made to feel more comfortable in your damnation. What job? I asked, falling into a nearby chair. Suddenly he was on his feet, sweeping the chair from under me, causing me to spill to the floor. On your knees, he screeched. On your knees before me. I looked up into his blazing face and I saw a madness there that could melt mountains and dry up entire oceans. I realized he was insane, driven mad by his own damnation. Forgive me, Lord, I groveled, laying on my belly like a worm, trying desperately to kiss his feet. You disgust me, he said, kicking my reaching hands away. Your kind has always disgusted me. He seemed somewhat calmer now, and smiled down at me almost pityingly. Now you may sit, he said gesturing to the fallen chair, which I quickly righted and fell into, keeping a wary eye on him. But he only smiled and poured an oily substance that smelled like wine into a goblet before thrusting it into my hand. There has been an escape, uh, a breakout, 
if you will. Now, I don't know how it happened, but it has. Five souls have escaped the pit, and I want them back. No one escapes this place. No one defies me. Do you understand? Yeah, yes, master, I said quickly. He seemed to enjoy my turn of phrase and settled more comfortably into his chair before going on. These five, much like you, killers and degenerates, that's why I chose you. Your minds are somewhat similar. This will help you in the hunt. I mean, of course, other help will be provided, but first, I have an errand for you. A small test, if you will. He smiled, and the light of madness burned in his eyes. Now, go. He clicked his fingers, and once again I was cast into darkness. For a moment I feared I had been transported back to my cell, but then, then I felt the cold dirt on my face and sat up, taking a large, gasping breath. I let out a, a bellow of pain as I was reborn into the world. I was in a forest. Naked. And alone. Sitting in a shallow grave. I, I was suddenly aware of a searing pain in my throat and reached out, feeling the gaping wound there that even now had started to knit and close under my probing fingers. I tried to stand but sank back down to my knees, noticing that my pale skin was covered in streaks of blood. What is this? I mumbled. Where am I? You are in the body of a dead man. Or at least he was. A voice whispered in a sylvan hiss from above my head. Quickly I looked up. A large black snake looked down at me from flat reptilian eyes. Well? It hissed, revealing needle-like fangs. Hadn't you better be about the master's business? What business? I asked, staggering to my feet, twisting at the bindings that bound my bloody wrists. The man you seek is inside, it said, slithering further up a twisting branch. I followed its movements, noticing a bright light off in the distance. There are two men. One you must kill. The other will assist you once he has ascended the throne. I, I don't understand, I said, climbing out of my own grave where I stood, shaking in the frigid night air. What's to understand? The serpent hissed. Our master wants this oathbreaker dead, and you will be his instrument in this. Is he one of the five? The one of those who escaped? No, the snake replied. This is a mere errand and a trial, if you will. Now go. I grow tired of your endless questions, and I'm feeling the urge to bite something. Quickly, I scrambled away and headed towards the light, casting off my bindings as I went. After what seemed like endless walking through the night-shrouded forest, I stumbled upon a gravel driveway that led to a ranch-style-looking mansion. Wincing at the pain in my feet, I stared up at it, noticing that every light in the house seemed to burn, and yet that the night was deafeningly quiet. I approached the door and wondered if I should knock when it creaked open, as if by its own volition. The hallway was vast and carpeted, a deep crimson with a high decorative ceiling. A crystal chandelier twinkled, lending the place an almost ethereal quality. I was hearing something, a low humming coming from a nearby a nearby staircase. As I drew closer, I realized it was the voice of many people chanting from below a low-cut door embedded in the staircase itself. Taking a deep breath, unsure of what I would find within, I gently opened the door, revealing a set of rough, hewn stair steps leading down into a flickering gloom. As I ascended, the chanting grew louder, seeming to echo all around me. At the bottom of the stairs, I turned a tight corner, and I was greeted by the sight of a vast cavern, filled with glowing black candles. The room was overflowing with people in hooded black robes, all but one stood by what looked like an ancient altar, red-robed, knife poised to strike at the bound naked girl writhing upon the stone. Behind him hung a great black cross, inverted a glowing pentagram carved into the middle, depicting the face of some horned beast. 
At the sight of me, the man dropped the knife and began to shake violently, attracting the attention of the other men in the room. That's, this cannot be, he gasped. You're dead. I, I killed you myself. I was just about to answer him when my mouth dropped open and Lucifer's voice issued forth. David, 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 I thought we had a deal. Is, is that you, master? The man replied, falling to his knees. The others seeing this did the same, pushing their foreheads into the dust. You know damn well who this is, the voice hissed from between my lips. We had an agreement, David. Once a month, when the moon was at its fullest, you would sacrifice two virgins unto me, a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve. In return, I would give you power, make you the leader of this coven. A and more has been done, great lord, the man whimpered. You lie, the voice screamed. This one was no virgin. Th that's impossible. He was one of the coven. He would, he would never lie to me. The voice laughed then. You overestimate your power over these dogs. This one lied to you because he hated you and knew he would bring my wrath upon you for such an unworthy sacrifice. And he was correct. I can hardly blame him for this, the priest cried out, crawling on his knees towards me until his cold hand caressed my feet. <laughs> but you can, the voice laughed, causing my head to look down upon his prone form. Besides, I grow tired of your nightly devotions. You bore me. Please, master, the man begged, but the voice had left my lips and was now in my head. Kill the fool. Kill him, then tell Bartholomew. He is now the leader of this coven, and that he is to assist you in any way and by any means. Do this and earn your place as my emissary upon earth. And just like that, he was gone. Murder, of course, was not unknown to me. In my former life, I had been quite insane and a prolific killer, but that was, that was before my rebirth. The desire had fled from me, but the knowledge had not. Besides, the groveling man before me was evil, a follower of Lucifer, but was I, was I not the same? I tried to tell myself that that wasn't true. That I had been pressed into the Dark One's service. I should not kill this man regardless of his crimes. But in the end... In the end, my fear won out. And with a cry, I brought the sole of my foot crashing down on the back of his exposed neck. Breaking his spine. Killing him instantly. Bartholomew, I said, trying to interject some authority into my voice. Come forth. A tall, slender man with graying beard separated himself from the crowd and approached me warily, his deep sunken eyes never leaving my face. I am Bartholomew, he said in rich tones and, and bowing low. How can I help you, master? Your master is gone, but he left you a message, I said, tapping my skull. He says you are now leader here, and master of this coven, and that you are to assist me. If the news pleased him, he did not show it. And how may I be of assistance? He said, drawing closer. I was suddenly aware of the many eyes watching us. Perhaps we can talk somewhere more private, I said, nodding towards the watching cultists. Of course. All your needs shall be met, and then... You will tell me everything. His request sounded very much like a demand, but I let it slide. All I wanted was a good warm meal and a hot shower after the depths of hell. That in itself would seem like a small slice of heaven. An hour later found me in a small study, sitting by a roaring fire, my belly full and wearing a brand new set of clothes. Bartholomew pacing impatiently around me. So, he said, stopping the endless pacing and turning to face me. So tell me why you're here. You're surely not Matthew, he sneered. Matthew, the boy whose flesh you inhabit. 
And how do you know I'm not Matthew? I didn't, he laughed. You just told me. My name is, was, Christian Davis. I was in hell for... But that was something I didn't know. What date is it? I asked. What year? Why does it matter? It matters because I want to fucking know because you've been commanded to obey me. He bridled at that. I believe the word you used was assist. But the date is October 16th, 2022. Forty years, I gasped. I was in that place for forty years? What place? He asked excitedly. You were in hell, weren't you? Did you see him? Did you, did you meet the Dark Father? Yes, I replied. I met him. And you're truly blessed above all men. I myself hope to stand in his glorious presence someday. You may want to hope for something else. He is about as crazy as a shithouse rat. How dare you! He recoiled from me. If you were not the Dark Prince's chosen, I would tear out your tongue with hot pincers for your blasphemies. But I am his chosen, I shrugged. And for why I'm here, I'm looking for five prisoners. Escapees from hell. Five, you say? His face growing suddenly excited as he scurried behind the nearby desk and pulled out a large black file. This appeared on our doorstep about a week ago. We did not understand why or what it was, but now, now I think I know, he said, dropping the file in my lap. It was sent here to help you. I did not reply, but I snapped open the folder. Inside were pictures of three men and two women. All were blank except one that had a name and an address written across the back in flowing black script. Underneath the address, written in large capital letters, was one word. First. I turned the picture back over and took a long, hard look at the woman staring back at me. She was incredibly beautiful, with flowing black hair, skin the color of moonlight, emerald green eyes. I turned the picture back over, looking at her name and address. Ann Tomlinson. 46... Kiln Close, Bar Harbor, Maine. It suddenly came to me that I had no idea where I was. Everyone I had met so far spoke with an American accent, but if I was in the good old USA, then whereabouts had my resurrection taken place? Where am I? asked Bartholomew, who was now leaned over the back of my chair, staring at the girl's picture intently. Massachusetts. He shot right back as if he'd been expecting the question. Cape Cod, to be precise. Okay, not too far away then, I mused. About a five or six hour drive. So you can set out in the morning. I'll have a car ready and waiting for you. Come, I'll show you to your room. I was just about to stand when the fire suddenly flared in a great gout of flame, causing me to cry out in alarm before suddenly dying back down and quickly going out. In the glowing ashes, there was a wicked-looking dagger. A long bone handle in which strange archaic runes had been carved. The dagger of fate, Bartholomew gasped. Pushing me aside, he fell on his knees and scooped the dagger up, but as soon as his skin made contact, the dagger glowed white hot. With a scream of pain, the high priest cast it back into the ashes, great tears in his eyes as he cradled his wounded hands. Guess it's not for you, I said. As I dropped to my knees where I reached out a tentative finger and gave the dagger a quick prod. When it didn't react, I took a deep breath and scooped it up, wincing against the pain. But there was nothing. It only sat in my hand, feeling like, like a perfect fit against my palm. The dagger of fate. Bartholomew repeated, his pain almost forgotten in the wonder of the thing. Do you know what you hold in your hand? That dagger was once wielded by Lucifer. In heaven, it is said that the archangel Michael still bears the scars of its touch. I looked in wonder at his shining blade. Michael, I whispered, knowing this blade had tasted the blood of angels. 
God help us all. The trip from Cape Cod to Bar Harbor was uneventful. Bartholomew had provided me with my own vehicle, snow tires and all. In the glove compartment I found a 9mm Glock and two large rolls of 20s. I used some of the cash to fill up the gas tank and grab the odd stale sandwich along the way. It was just getting towards dusk when I pulled into the car park of the Ocean View Hotel. Bartholomew had already called ahead and booked me a room. I had no ID, of course, but he told me it wouldn't be a problem. Just tell the clerk my name was Johnson and pay in cash. It was all taken care of. After a quick dinner in the hotel restaurant, I left the hotel with my folder and sat on a nearby beach. The sun was just starting to set and the smell of snow lay heavy in the air. I opened the folder and looked at the picture of my intended victim. I wondered what such a beauty had done to buy herself a one-way ticket to hell. And what right, if any, I had to send her back there. From behind me came a scramble of claws, and I cried out as something heavy fell against my shoulder before landing in my lap. It, it was a rat, a, a huge rat. With a cry of fear, I leapt to my feet, sending the loathsome creature toppling into the sand where it scrambled to its feet before settling down on its haunches, looking at me with disdain. Thanks for that, it said, brushing sand from its fur. Lucifer, I gasped, sitting back down hard. Is that you? No, it's a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Who do you think it is? What are you doing here? I said. Looking around, but the beach was deserted. I came to talk to you. It would seem you're having some misgivings about this little venture of ours. I said nothing, but slammed the folder shut guiltily. The rat smiled then, showing yellowing canines before scurrying a little closer. Shall I tell you about the beautiful Miss Tomlinson? She's a killer. A killer of both men and children. She uses her looks to wed wealthy men, then she poisons them and their children and takes the life insurance. All right, Black Widow, this one. She had wiped out two whole families before she met her end. Not that it mattered. The police had already started to zero in on her activities anyway. How did she die? I asked, interested now. A simple mugging gone wrong. She was shot to death, fitting end, some would say. But now she's back and up to her old ways. She's found herself another sugar daddy and works on getting herself reestablished in the world. But you are going to stop her and send her back to me. The suffering she endured in hell will seem like a child's party compared to the agonies she will suffer at her return. But how will I know it's her? At this, he looked genuinely surprised. Y you have her picture right there, he said, nodding towards the file. Y yes, but surely she won't look like that anymore. She'll be clothed in different flesh, am I right? No, no, he chuckled. She is, as you see her in the photo. How? I asked, genuinely confused. Why is she not like me, encased in the body of another? He sighed, sounding genuinely bored. You're clothed in the flesh of this boy because you had no body to return to. After your execution, your remains were burned and scattered to the winds. Anne, however, was drawn back to her own body. All her spirit had to do was literally sit in her grave and her resurrection began. But how? How was she able to do these things? Again, he shrugged. I really have no idea. My best bet is that she had some help. Just like she was helped in her escape. Someone in hell believes it's time for a change of management. And this escape was orchestrated to undermine me. But these things are of no regard to you. All you have to do is go to the address you were given, destroy her body, and release her soul back unto me. I would suggest you be about it. My patience is growing thin. Use the dagger. Give me back what's mine. And just like that, he was gone, leaving an incredibly surprised rodent in his wake who scampered off into the darkness. My original intention was to get a good night's sleep, then begin the stalking process in the morning. I knew all about stalking a victim. I had done it a lot in my former occupation. 
Fuck it, I whispered into the dark. Let's just get it done. Moments later, I was in my car and driving over to her address. Didn't take long to get there. Her house was only situated a few blocks from Ocean View, a nice, stately-looking manor house set back a little from the rest of the houses at the end of the street. The place screamed of money, and from what I had been told of our girl, it suited her profile perfectly. Parking the car across from the looming gate, I turned off the light and snuggled down on my seat. I was in for a long wait, new from previous experience. The wee hours of the morning were the best time to strike. I felt some of the old excitement returning, but crushed it. I was not that person anymore. This was business, not pleasure. She deserves everything she gets, I thought to myself. But this brought little comfort. You're all doomed. In the end, everybody pays. It was just a little after 2 a.m. when I made my move. Climbing out of the car, I took the hell-bound blade and stuffed it inside my jacket. Keeping it low, I headed across the street. The gates were large and high, but I managed to scramble over them with extraordinarily little effort before heading up the tree-lined driveway, keeping to the shadows, praying there was no security lights or alarms I could accidentally trigger. If there were, none sounded. I approached the front entrance, relieved that the house was still and extremely quiet. The thing now was what to do next, knowing it to be a fruitless endeavor. I reached out and gently tried the front doorknob. Finding it locked, I moved on to the other side of the house, checking the windows as I went, finding them all locked and secure. Okay, I mumbled. Only one thing for it. Returning to the front of the house, I simply rang the doorbell and waited. The door was almost immediately opened by none other than Anne Tomlinson herself. If I had not recognized her from her photo, the black pulsing aura that surrounded her would have immediately given her away. She laughed, and then reached out a slender arm tracing her hand inches from my face, and I realized. I realized she was seeing the exact same aura on myself. Well, well, she grinned. Another escape E. Your timing couldn't be better. Come in. I could use your help. I said nothing to this, but followed her inside, closing the door frame behind us. Tell me, she said, turning to face me. How'd you find me? I haven't seen or heard from any of the others since we escaped. How'd you manage to get out? Did Asmodeus help you? Yes, it was uh, Asmodeus. I lied, knowing that I now knew the name of Hell's Traitor. He told me to come here to help you. My story was thin, but her arrogance seemed to believe it. Very good, she said, tossing her hair. Best to get to it, then. He's upstairs. Come. She said, taking the lead and heading up the stairs. This way. I followed, trying hard to keep my eyes off her shapely rear. I was just about to get rid of him when you turned up. She threw open a door and revealed a bedroom within. Lying in the bed was... A dead man. His skin the color of old slate, his mouth and neck covered in green bile. Poor Tom. The most terrible stomach ache after dinner. Poor thing went to bed. Seems he must have died in his sleep. He killed him. I rounded on her. Me? She said, her face the picture of innocence, one hand squeezed between her ample breasts like some heroine from a 1930s flick. Of course not. Seems to me like he choked on his own vomit. No, come along, she said, moving over to the bed. Make yourself useful and grab his legs. Before we get started, I said, reaching into my jacket, I have a gift for you, from hell. Something in my voice must have betrayed me. And she turned just as I pulled the knife. What's this? She said, backing away. Her eyes never left my face as she circled backwards, putting the bed between us. You're going back, I said, pacing towards her. Back to hell, where you belong. Wait, she said, holding out a slender arm before suddenly pulling her flimsy nightgown over her head and standing before me in all her naked glory. Why are you doing this? She ran her hands down her smooth, naked thigh. My eyes followed. 
giving her just the distraction she needed. With a cry of triumph, she sprang onto the bed and launched a hard kick that sent me square in the face, setting me crashing backwards into a nearby closet. As she ran for the door, cursing, I leapt to my feet, tasting my own blood as I chased after her, catching her on the stairs where I swung the knife blindly, opening up her back in a welter of blood. She screamed out in pain, taking two steps at a time, before hitting the floor and spinning into the hallway. I was still hot on her tail, slashing at her arms and unprotected back. We crashed through a door and into a moonlit kitchen, where she scrambled at a half-open drawer before turning towards me with the largest kitchen knife I had ever seen. So, you want to play fucking games? She hissed her hatred making her once beautiful face almost beast-like and feral. Let's play. With a scream, she charged me, slashing at my face. I felt the blade tear into my flesh, spilling hot blood down my neck. With a cry of triumph, she swung again, this time slashing at my chest, opening on my shirt and slicing at my nipple in two. Screaming with pain, I fell back through the door, landing hard on my back. Seconds later, she barged through, knife raised high for the killing strike, but the blow never came. Instead, she stood there, shaking. Her eyes locked upon my chest as the great wound there began to heal and knit itself close. How? she gasped. I answered her with cold blackened steel, driving the blade deep into her thigh, piercing the artery with a spray of blood. She screamed high and loud and turned to shuffle away, but I leapt to my feet and grabbed her by the back of her hair, exposing her delicate throat, which I cut long and deep with practiced ease before casting her now dead body back to the floor. Almost immediately, her skin began to smoke and char. The carpet blackened under her, and she erupted into searing flames. In the roaring inferno, I saw a writhing apparition appear, and knew this was her tortured soul, trying desperately to escape, but it was too late. Out of the flames burst a hundred crawling hands that grasped and tore at her. For a second, she reached out to me with an imploring hand. With a final cheated scream, she was gone. I expected the flames to die down, but they continued to grow, revealing a gaping black void below me. I was suddenly falling through a black abyss that seemed to have no end until I landed hard upon a cold stone floor. With a cry and realizing where I was, I staggered to my feet once again. Once again in Lucifer's great hall. The king of hell himself loomed above me from his golden throne. You've done well, he said, grabbing my arm as I staggered to my feet. But, as they say, no rest for the wicked. He waved an arm and a fiery portal opened before me. So, I said, trying to show some bravado. Where to next? He laughed, then patted me on the back. Not so much where. Uh, more like... When? I looked at him, startled. Oh, you didn't think it was all going to be that easy, did you? When? I gasped. Still laughing with an evil glint in his eye, he shoved me through the portal. His terrible laughter followed me down through the eons of time. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It really helps me out whenever you guys do things like listen, or watch. And it really helps if you guys also subscribe to the podcast, or subscribe to the YouTube channel, or do things like clicking the bell, or clicking the like button. For those of you who are looking to actually talk to me live, and not just listen to me on the podcast, or the live stream, or what have you, then you can actually head over to twitch.tv slash MrCreepyPasta, where I record a lot of these episodes that you see live. Also, it's just fun for me to be able to interact with you guys, and sometimes we do other fun games. And as always, I want to give a very special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the ones who help me keep the lights on the house, as well as allow me to do things like commission brand new stories. In case you guys haven't noticed, we hit that tier. <laughs> so... A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stricken, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krause, G Weevil 3, Tristan Pelton, 1 800 Nightmare, Acid System, Aaron Stormcrow, Azarine Fox, Bobby Carmen, Chris Lovin, Cryptic Nightmares, The Doctor, Daniel Polson, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Euro Gore, Freddy Krueger, Fried Chicken 12, Hades Nephew, Infertile One, James Bruce, James Lowe, 
Jason VR Wilson, Jimbo the Hutt, Jordan Nels, Jordan Johnson, Caleb Dougal, Kiri the Sloth, Legit Quad Feed, Liam Newman, Lisa Cottrell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Michael Scarborough, Nico Kyle, Nina Smith, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Rafael Rodriguez, Robert White, S Man, Sky Harbor, Snails Burnett, Talon Carlick, The Ginger Bros, Trace Miles, Suji Campbell, Tinyany, Unknown Nobody, Andre Garcia, Brianna Wright, Brian Ace, Caspian, Hogunchi, and someone you love. And also a very special thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. All you guys who are listed as Patreons and everybody who's even supporting for just $1, I really love and appreciate you guys. And if you want to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash Pasta. Even a dollar a month, honestly, it keeps the show going. So thank you guys so much. And to everyone out there, sweet dreams.